Okay, well, listen, uh, good afternoon. Happy Friday. Uh, it's nice to have a little sunshine uh, out the window um, right now. This has been, a, uh, it's been I guess, week nine of uh, the um, COVID-19 uh, remote work lockdown essential business exper experiment. And uh, I know just from talking to so many of you over the course of the last week, there's a uh, both a, an enthusiasm for the news that we got this week around returning to work and uh, the fact that uh, Central New York is one of the first five regions in New York State that's going to be allowed uh, starting today to get uh, certain businesses back online. That's obviously very good news for the economy. And uh, we also know, we've heard from many of you, uh, the anxiety that it creates around making sure that uh, you're, you're in a position as business owners and not-for-profit leaders to keep your employees safe, uh, to keep your businesses running, um, and to take care of your customers as well, especially for those who are in sort of retail facing businesses. So what we thought would be a really good opportunity now is all of us uh, have some increasing clarity around what the state is going to expect from us as we begin to reopen. We wanted to bring you uh, some lessons from the front lines. I think one of the things that um, for those of us who have been working remote, certainly our team at Center State has, uh, I think it, it is sometimes easy to forget that we have a huge number of businesses in our region in central New York that have been operating, uh, not quite business as usual, but have been operating at full capacity over the course of, uh, over the course of the last nine weeks. Uh, their employees have been going to work every day. They have been coming home from work every day. They've been finding ways to keep themselves and their families safe and to keep their businesses operating. And I think uh, those lessons are the lessons that we want to bring to you today. We're really uh, really grateful. Uh, we've got uh, tremendous uh, partners at PPC at Rapid Response and Kitty Hoynes who are, have agreed to share some lessons with you of how they've managed to transition their business into a, a safe work environment uh, during this pandemic. And, and our hope is that these lessons will prompt some questions, they'll get you thinking about your own business reopening plan, and they will provide some inspiration to you as well as maybe ease some anxiety. Uh, this is something that has been done, it can be done, uh, we're all going to figure it out together uh, as we start to open up the economy and get people back to work. So I just want to thank Floyd, Spencer, and David uh, for agreeing to spend some time with us today and, uh, and sharing their lessons with you. I also just want to point out, I know, um, you know, this is actually uh, on our webinar last Friday, we released our reopening toolkit. Uh, it's been the single most uh, visited part of our website over the course of the last week. I think uh, we've had almost three or 4,000 people visit and download uh, the checklist and the reopening toolkit. Um, we're really gratified to, to see that. Our team spent a lot of time trying to pull best practices together from across industries and, and really empower all of you with some tools uh, to start thinking about what reopening looks like. If you haven't found it already, you know, please check our website at centerstateceo.com. There's a link right on the front page to, to these resources. Uh, if there's anything that you see that's missing from there that we can do better, uh, let us know. One of the most frequently asked questions we've gotten in the last week is, uh, if I need to provide PPE to my employees, where can I find it? Uh, and on the Business Toolkit page, uh, you, uh, there are links uh, to businesses right here in Central New York that have the ability to help you source masks and hand sanitizer and so many other things. So. Um, please check out the toolkit. If you've got challenges or specific questions, reach out to us at support at centerstateceo.com. Okay, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, you know, we've, we've been fortunate in building our own toolkit. We've had the benefit of some expertise of a number of our members who've been up and operating uh, throughout this pandemic. And Floyd is, uh, and the folks at PPC are one of the uh, companies that I talk to uh, really early. I mean, we're talking, you know, days after the shutdown order, maybe even the first day of the shutdown order, uh, about what they were experiencing, helping them navigate through some of the New York State essential business guidance. Uh, you know, as a as a, a company in the telecommunications space, they've been uh, deemed an essential business all along, and and Floyd is responsible for uh, operations at PPC and, and the person responsible for keeping his team safe. So I'll pause here and turn the program over for the next few minutes to uh, to Floyd. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm Floyd Backus. Hello, everyone. VP of Global Operations for PPC Broadband. We are a Belden brand, part of uh, the Belden parent company. PPC is uh, a longstanding Syracuse business with our headquarters here on East Malloy Road. 
we have 10 manufacturing facilities around the world in nine different countries. And as uh, Rob mentioned, we have been, we have been dealing with the, the COVID response since January uh, as a company. One of our sites globally is in Suzhou, China. So we were, we were uh, very focused on this very early and we learned a lot from our team in Suzhou that enabled us to, uh, to really hit the ground running and uh, I, I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to uh, Roland Lua and our team in Suzhou. What a, what a great effort they have. Uh, they really blazed a trail for us. And, uh, and so then um, I just wanted to walk you through some of the things that, that worked for us. We have maintained operational status at all 10 of our global facilities, aside from three weeks at two facilities, one in Africa and one in India that were closed due to governmental restrictions, those are back fully operational now. So we've maintained uh, customer satisfaction, employee safety at those 10 global sites uh, throughout the entire crisis. So I, I'm, I'm grateful and, and thankful to Rob and Center State CEO for inviting me to, uh, to help share some of the things that, that we've been able to learn and, and to, uh, to do successfully. So we can go to the next slide. Um, really, it's, it's going to be, uh, uh, just a, a, an overview of how we developed uh, the pandemic response plan, what that looked like, what we did to uh, purchase materials and to prepare in, uh, in order to implement that pandemic protocol, and then initiating the pandemic response plan, and that was customized for each of our locations. Um, with Syracuse here being the headquarters, uh, we've got 350 people here in, uh, in Syracuse, and about half of them are. Uh, direct labor employees. So the, uh, the local environment really played a big part for each of our sites in, in determining when and uh, you know, how quickly to enact this protocol. And then uh, a little bit about how we've been able to sustain, track, and improve our, uh, our performance as we, as we have gone along. Next slide. So on uh, you know, February of 2020, we completed the pandemic preparedness uh, response plan um, as a global effort. Um, certainly we had one in place in our Suzhou plant and in the rest of the plants um, that crystallized into a global approach um, early February. So, so very quickly um, put that to paper and, and, and with the goal of preventing and handling that COVID-19 uh, crisis effectively, with a safety first policy. We have a uh, tremendous responsibility, of course, to the safety of our employees, also to the customer service and to our shareholders. And uh, we as a company, uh, PPC has, has been demonstrating a safety first approach um, for, for many years, and, and this was no exception. Uh, so the key components to this were aligning, first of all, first and foremost, with the local, state, and uh, federal authorities uh, on their guidelines. We want to make sure that this pandemic protocol was scalable, reproducible to all sites. Some of these challenges um, will be familiar to anyone with a global uh, view on their business. And then um, I'll really try to stay focused on the Syracuse uh, facility since it's our headquarters, it's our biggest site, and I think it's most relevant for this audience. And then we have detailed and specific uh, requirements uh, for this thing to be effective and sustainable. You know, uh, with 1,400 employees around the world, we need to make sure that these, these protocols are, uh, are achievable and realistic, very practical approach. And then make sure uh, that it was flexible. Um, so we have some size, uh, team sizes are different, uh, different environments, and of course, you know, every, uh, every plant has its own unique culture that uh, we want to make sure that we took that into account. Next slide, please. So uh, purchasing materials and preparing to implement, um, you know, we went, first of all, we created a, a team, uh, a pandemic preparedness team at every site, somebody to help uh, decide materials required, somebody for communications, operations, and so on. So there's a, a list of things here that, that we had to, uh, to go out and, and procure to be ready. Laptops, uh, software licenses, masks, which uh, um, were hard to come come by in some of the locations, but we were on it early enough that it, uh, 
with regard to the uh, the surgical masks, we have been able to use those as we had uh, deemed necessary and as the CDC guidance would have us do. Uh, san hand sanitizer and then uh, non-contact temperature guns and the disinfectant solutions. So those those were the key materials. And then for preparing, um, we had to document each employee's remote workability because for half of the population, we'll talk in Syracuse here, half the 350 people, we deemed abil uh, able to work remotely. And so that was an important piece. And then we trained uh, employees on the pandemic preparedness response plan, everything from uh, uh, sanitization, um, personal hygiene, how we were going to go about uh, changing the, the layouts and, and the approach to getting people into the plant um, were all things that, that really needed uh, a very detailed approach. And then updated uh, the factory and the break room layouts to accommodate the social distancing. Um, so you see some some images there. We, we've uh, we've made those changes at all the facilities and uh, we, ha we are fortunate enough to have the space to be able to do that and to do it effectively. And I know that that's not a luxury, I think, uh, that everyone can say they have, but it's, it was an important part for us to be able to, uh, to get people as far apart as we could, um, at least uh, the six foot minimum. Next slide, please. So then uh, the next step was to initiate that pandemic um, response plan and we really followed the guidance of the, the, the local authorities. Um, and when that uh, you know, state of emergency was declared locally, we sent the uh, eligible employees as we were prepared to do with their laptops and their software and we sent them home. We said, don't come back until we're ready. And uh, that has been the case as Rob mentioned for nine weeks now. Um, plant supervision, we created uh, on that day, uh, the ability for that second string of our plant supervision to go work remotely. The plan here was we had a first string um, able to cover all of the factory needs for supervision and the folks at home in case something happened with an outbreak, we wanted to be sure that we were ready to, uh, to make sure that continuity of business continued. Uh, temperature check stations were added, the break times were split by team and the seating densities uh, adjusted accordingly. We did assembly lines, um, staffing for distance so it's really a six foot we moved workstations um, and changed the layout of the floor we propped open doors we increased airflow one of the key components of our pandemic protocol is uh, ventilation we adjusted our shift schedules to give an hour between each shift and to spread people out throughout the plant throughout the 24 hours in a day um, so that was an important piece it gave us an hour in between each shift to disinfect all the touch points in the break rooms um, twice a day, but also between shifts, um, and then removed any earplug dispensers and uh, all employees are required to wear face coverings. And so we, we implemented these uh, in stages. You know, the, the face coverings was a result of um, the CDC guidance and New York State guidance. And so we were ready to do that. Um, next slide. And then we moved into sustaining, tracking, and improving. Um, we have regular updates from the leadership team on the site status. This was an important part. We meet daily with the uh, operations folks and the production associates, working with employees uh, that may have had underlying medical conditions. Uh, we, we, we were as flexible as possible to give them options to remain at home. Multiple safety training videos. We did uh, change our uh, employee attendance um, policies so that we, we allowed a little more flexibility there. What we didn't want was people coming into the plant sick. So we, we took away the point system temporarily for, uh, for this period. We've, we've also paid employees to stay home uh, for test results, awaiting test results when, that, when the symptoms and the, and the local authorities deemed a test was appropriate. Any positive uh, COVID test results, we um, communicated to anyone. We did contact tracing and so we did a, a confidential communication, anybody who was in close personal contact and sent them for a quarantine and test as well. Um, we worked overtime instead of adding additional temps as we normally would, we would bring in temporary labor when surges in demand hit us. And of course, in the broadband industry, that's, that's happened to us on a, on a pretty regular basis since the crisis started. Um, customers are very much wanting to stay connected and to keep their customers connected. 
actively soliciting employee ideas and suggestions. So this is one of the most important parts of this whole program. We've implemented um, a number of suggestions that come from employees as a site in Syracuse. This, this uh, employee suggestion program has uh, achieved a 1,000 idea implementation um, over the last 12 months. And so this is not new, but it is increasingly important as you get into these crisis situations. It's, it's, a, it's a pipeline direct to management for each of the employees to be able to have their voice heard. And so more food variety in the self-serve vending machines, adjusting the work hours, displaying uh, social distancing reminders throughout the plant. Um, one person at a time at the hand washing sink, which is normally a multi-use and then single use ear protection packaging versus the bulk dispensers. These were all directly employee suggestions, again, amongst hundreds uh, that we've received and implemented. Uh, we've got an 80% implementation rate, by the way, on those 1,000 su suggestions per year. So very, very good suggestions, a great program. Next slide. And results and lessons learned. So of the PPC, uh, 1,400 employees at 10 manufacturing sites over nine countries, We've had four people, unfortunately, test positive. Uh, the good news is they have all recovered, and uh, those cases were all contained quickly. So we did not see spread within any any uh, any site, which is first and foremost that was our our ultimate goal. And then employee morale is good, customer satisfaction remains high. All our key performance indicators have sustained in the green range throughout the entire crisis. Those are things that we we measure on a daily basis for our business performance. And lessons learned, um, deploying leadership to the front lines quickly when concerns arise is, is in my opinion, in my view, in my experience, the most important thing um, with, with that employee engagement, we have, uh, we have a responsibility to get the management out in front quickly. So I know we're, we're running low on time. Um, so just be flexible and, and to keep safety and business continuity happening together. That's really, uh, that's been the secret for us and it's worked. Hey, well, Floyd, uh, thank you so much for uh, for walking folks through that. I know the uh, have taught you early in this process. I know the the time and energy you all put into to building a plan, to executing that plan. It's it's nice to see, um, you know, how it's all come together and, and uh, the impact it's had for your business and your employees. Uh, a reminder for folks: uh, please send your questions in through the chat box. Uh, we'll have a chance here after we've heard from all three speakers to engage all back and forth and we're going to base that on the questions that you have for them. So uh, don't miss an opportunity to, to send a question in via chat. Uh, next up, I'm uh, really happy to have uh, one of our great uh, companies here in the, the city of Syracuse down in the Inner Harbor, Rapid Response Monitoring Services. Uh, and we've got Spencer Moore, the VP of Sales and Marketing, joining us to share a little bit about uh, how they've been operating. Unlike PPC, as you'll hear about from Spencer in a moment, uh, you know, rapid response is um, is in more of a traditional office environment. Uh, and so, uh, as opposed to a manufacturing operation, we wanted to try to showcase a variety of uh, strategies for different types of businesses, knowing that there's certainly no one size fits all plan uh, out there for every business in Central New York. So without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to Spencer Moore. Spencer, you may be on mute. I was waiting for the host to unmute me. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate the invite, Rob. It's, uh, it's great to be here. You can see a, uh, a copy of our call center here. This is a, uh, we have both a normal office environment as Rob alluded to, and then also uh, we are an emergency call center. So what we support is security systems, fire alarms, medical alarms, uh, basically any sort of device that's out there that would send some sort of emergency signal that would uh, need to be qualified and then uh, cleared and dispatched by a, a, a PSAP or an emergency response center. So as you can see here, we've got a, a large facility. It's, it's almost 80,000 square feet. Uh, we support about 500 people uh, in this facility. And it's a 24 seven operation. So we have a lot of unique challenges. Um, when having to, to understand and deal with the pandemic of this crisis. But what's also really interesting about how we're set up is we are designed and built to be redundant. So if you look at our facility, we have four generators that together can put out over three megawatts of power with a flip of a switch. That's enough power to, to power 30 homes for a month. 
with just a flip of a switch. We have battery backups to support all of our systems. We can run our whole building on critical systems for about 24 hours on batteries alone. We have uh, access control, armed guards, biometric access to get into the facility, all of these things to create a redundant, hardened environment, but none of which protect us from the invisible enemy of a virus pandemic. And so uh, much like the rest of the world, we had to adapt um, and take that same mentality that we have for all the physical redundancies that we have, the network redundancies we have, the power redundancies that we have, and start building them into how we're managing our team on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I think Floyd did a, a great job of sharing some best practices that you'll hear me echo as we talk about some of the things uh, that we've done. You know, one of the questions that uh, we've been asked to sort of answer is, is what are the greatest operational challenges that we've seen during this crisis? And, and for us as a, a business who focuses on making sure that our people are, uh, are in their seats, in their offices, and our offices are hardened and redundant and protected, that one of the largest challenges that we had it was to take the non-support personnel, which we moved to a work from home strategy in March, and gear them up and move them home in a way that uh, was still secure for our environment and prevented us from attack um, because now we're doing everything virtually. And so that was a major challenge that we had to overcome, but one that we were able to. We moved just about 200 people to a work from home strategy in under a week and it was a, a feat uh, for our IT team to be able to complete and uh, something that uh, I'm very proud of and thankful that uh, that team was able to do for us. One of the other things I want to talk about, and you can flip to the next slide here, Krista. I just have, have one slide that I'll keep up while, um, while I go through and talk about some of the different things that we're doing here. Um, and, and, you know, when we think about our customers and we think about our employees primarily, you know, we're interested in making sure that uh, they're feeling as comfortable as possible when coming to the workplace. Because as an essential service, they're all still reporting to work. That's where we have all those hardened redundancies, right? It's not possible for us to move them to a work from home strategy because all of the telecommunications come into our data center in Syracuse and are protected there in that data center. So we had to do a lot of things. And one of the things that we did was make sure from the beginning that we were very transparent. So executive leadership meets daily on coronavirus topics to make sure that we're following all the correct local guidelines to preemptively move forward in protecting our employees. And so you can see a sample here of this daily briefing update that we put out to the entire team so everybody knows what we're doing, what's going on, and they can feel comfortable with what we've done already and where we're moving forward to. Uh, we're really trying to help eliminate uncertainty and also provide a channel for sharing all sorts of information from any company programs, local programs, or state and federal programs that are out there during this time period. In the office, we, we've been lucky enough, fortunate, um, Floyd would mention that, that they had the space too. We recently expanded both of our offices. Um, and so we've been fortunate enough with that expansion that with the move out of the support departments, we're able to social distance our entire team. So if you look at the picture here on the right, you can see you can only really see one, one employee in the picture here because everybody's been social distanced in the cubes and we've been able to spread them out uh, throughout the entire facility. We've also uh, changed traffic patterns. So we've got one-way traffic, so you don't have people facing each other when they're moving um, around the facility. Um, we've moved to a, a mask program where we've had uh, masks made in our Corona facility by one of our employees and distributed uh, to, by, uh, at, the, at the company's cost to all the folks there. And then also we have uh, moved to a plan in Syracuse where everybody there is wearing masks. Again, company distributed as well. Um, and you've got to wear them anytime you're, you're moving about the facility or, or standing. Um, if you're seated at your desk, because of the nature of the work that we do, um, we allow them to remove the, remove the facial coverings. We also implemented thermal scanning for, temp, for body temperature. So when you enter the facility, you pass in front of a thermal camera, and that thermal camera has an alarm set to it that will uh, trip if you're over a certain temperature. And then if you get tripped by the alarm, then you'll actually be scanned by one of the uh, no-touch infrared thermometers that you can see there on the bottom left of the screen as a double check. Um, and so that happens every time that you enter the facility. It also happens uh, midway through your shift. And we ask all of our employees to take their temperature prior to commuting to work. Um, and one of the things that we did there is we offered up 
um, employee uh, or excuse me, employer owned, company owned infrared thermometers to any employee that was interested in having one of those because they didn't have one at home. And so we've distributed well over 200 of those thermometers to our staff so they can take their temperature prior to commuting to the office. And if they're above the threshold, then we ask them to stay home. A few other things that, that we have is we've been fortunate with the completion of our expansion a couple years back in, in Syracuse. When we upgraded our HVAC system, we installed a UV filtration system, a stage one filtration system that kills mold, bacteria, spores, and other pathogens in, in the HVAC ductwork. Um, and, and kind of seeing this coming, uh, we ordered a stage two bio wall uh, filtration system, which is an upgrade to our current system that just recently has been um, installed and implemented. And that uh, UV filtration system actually kills uh, influenza, tuberculosis, COVID, a whole list of, of pathogens that pass through in the air. It's not perfect. It doesn't kill everything. Um, in the entire building, but it's a, it's a great safeguard for us to have, and it's something that makes our employees feel very comfortable about coming uh, to the work environment in the office. We're also uh, doing company-sponsored testing. If people feel unsafe and they want to get tested for antibody tests or they want to get tested to see if they, they um, have the virus because they have some sort of symptoms, we're sponsoring testing, and a lot of that's centered around making sure that the, the uh, folks are, are comfortable and, and feeling like it's safe for them to come to the workplace. We're doing announcements about some of the different programs we have based on insurance, like uh, MD Live, where you can remotely connect with your with a, uh, a primary care physician if you have some kind of condition that you need to get help with. You can do that without having to feel like you need to go to the doctor's office if you're worried about that. Um, the EAP program is another program that we support for our team members if they feel like they need some kind of assistance. And then additionally, we have a, a, a very strong team of, of housekeeping and maintenance staff, numbers 32 in our facility in Syracuse. And because of the work from home strategy, um, they're able to focus a lot more of their efforts on the areas that are filled with our, our operations team that are doing the critical work in the call center of supporting people during emergencies. So those are some of the things that we're doing to really keep employees in a place where they feel comfortable to make sure that we're creating and maintaining a safe work environment. Um, but we've also been able to, you know, adapt some of our strategies and how we attack business, right, in terms of growing our business and, and maintaining business continuity. And, and so a lot of that is doing things like what we're doing here with, with a digital strategy. Um, we've held, since the uh, nine weeks have gone on, we've launched a new service. We did that entirely digitally, had our largest uh, participation in any of our digital events. Uh, with well over a thousand registrants to that uh, to that service launch, and we're also putting on uh, events just like this for our customer community, where they can get together and they can share best practices for what's going on in, in their neck of the woods. Because we are a B to B to C type of uh, type of organization, they're finding a lot of value in that, and they're being able to uh, learn from each other, much like we're all learning from each other here today, uh, sponsored by Center State CEO. It's, uh, it's also been interesting because it's opened some of our, our customers' minds. A lot of the business owners that we support are um, first-generation business owners that have been in business 20, 30, 40 years. And some of them are, doing, are used to doing things the old way. Um, and they're not really the, the, most, uh, the first person to adopt new technology. And so being forced into a strategy where uh, they have to adapt in order to be able to continue to operate well uh, we found is, is a great time for us to help coax them along, coach them, teach them, and show them the way to utilize some of the new technology that we bring as a technology forward company to be able to serve them and their customers. Uh, one example of that that's close to home is Onondaga County, as of, as of today, uh, just went online with us as a ASAP to PSAP um, organization. What that means is the Onondaga County Emergency Center now can electronically accept dispatches from us. We no longer have to call them on the phone and, and let them know where they need to go to, to respond to a fire alarm that we get or a medical alarm that we get. And so that's a technology that's been um, increasing in use over the course of the last few years. And we expect, because of the pandemic, to continue uh, at an even faster, faster clip. So Rob, I'll, I'll toss it back over to you. I want to make sure we have enough time for Dave. 
Great. Well, uh, thank you, Spencer. And I think one of the one of the things that comes out uh, loud and clear from both of these presentations so far is the uh, you know putting the employee front and center in the in the plan, right? right? And, and really thinking about uh, how they're going to experience this, uh, both you know in their um, you know, as it relates to their experience at work, but also as it relates to their experience at home. And I think that's a really important piece of this. One of the interesting aspects I'm sure that we'll, uh, we'll hear from David Hoyne uh, here in just a second is not just about employees, but it's also about customers as well, and particularly in, uh, in the food service industry. So uh, for those of you uh, who don't know David Hoyne, uh, the uh, owner and proprietor of, uh, of Kitty Hoynes, one of my favorite downtown uh, establishments, uh, really happy to have you here, David. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Rob, very much. Thanks for having me today. Um, Delighted to uh, learn once again today from Floyd and Spencer, you know, uh, great uh, presentations and uh, kind of envious of all of that set up and everything else. But uh, we will, uh, I would like to kind of go, go uh, through some different things uh, um, from opera operation challenges to how we take care of our employees and our customers, uh, opportunities and new strategies, and then just a little bit of uh, lessons learned. Uh, we have been open for the last nine weeks, uh, pretty much just changed completely around to takeout and curbside. That alone in itself was a huge battle, but gladly living uh, through it now and, as I said, learning every day. Um, we are a family-run business. Um, we have four employees working right now, plus, our, plus some family members. Um, so it's it's uh, what I'll share today is a uh, little of the past experiences for the nine weeks and also our our uh, plans for moving forward once we open up for phase three. Um, our number one priority has been uh, you know how do we take care of the safety and the actual health of the people that are working here, our guests, and our com community also. You know. Uh, we are in an industry that is highly regulated, and we feel we have a great foundation here already, uh, but to uh, build on because that's what's needed today. We've had great guidance ourselves from both national and uh, local um, entities, from the CDC to Food and Drug Administration, the EPA, Onondaga Health uh, Department, who are great partners and the National Restaurant Association through their Serve Safe courses for employees and different managers. Um, and even most uh, recently with the uh, Governor's New York State Safety Plan, I think it's a great focus for everybody to, re to really nut down exactly how you are operating safely. And, you know, I have to give fan fantastic credit to Center State for the toolkit. Um, Fantastic work there. Um, so it's a matter of putting everything into uh, operation and obviously uh, mandates seem to be changing daily. So it's very, very important to keep up with those. Um, uh, our staff have also helped formulate quite a lot of this. And um, once we start bringing back our, 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 uh, our uh, staff, just like we always uh, do, we, we, we always continually try to raise the bar in everything that we do. Um, you know, Kitty Hoynes Irish Pub Restaurant, you know, uh, back in the day, comfort used to be a, a nice padded stool. And um, how well was your cocktail crafted? I think nowadays, comfort is certainly how do I feel in this environment? Does, does your staff really care about your safety. You know, th those are big things right now and we are doing everything we can to, uh, to uh, get to those. Some of the uh, challenges we had um, just doing the whole 360 flip here to uh, move to, we, did, we never did any takeout or curbside, uh, trying to get that vendor relationships were uh, huge, whether it was paying your rent dealing with uh, different uh, suppliers that you owed uh, bills, bills to. So um, again, partnerships are very important back then and even more so now moving forward. Um, 
delivery commissions dealing dealing with that whole uh, entity. There are twenty five to thirty percent commissions. Uh, supply chain recently has just kind of uh, come into a lot for uh, restaurants. Uh, people, you know, Cisco even, you know, out of different numerous items, whether whether it's packaging, whether it's uh, perishable goods, uh, elevated pricing coming in for that. Um, our actual menu has uh, shifted also to be a little bit more uh, nimble to actually cut down on how many people we have working next to one another. So in order to spread them out, I wish I had the room, but we are we are making it work with our um, six foot distancing. Um, even, even our, you know, I think um, um, Spencer touched on it about businesses that have been open 20 plus uh, years, they don't necessarily move quicker these days. So uh, our whole point of sale system had a total redo. And I speak for other restaurants that have also gone on to buying different POS systems, being more online focused, touchless payment, uh, touchless ordering, everything else. So we have had to adapt for that also. Um, so more on our employees here, you know, um, probably pre-COVID-19 emphasis was on um, more efficient ways for speed of service, better labor efficiency. I think now it's extreme cleanliness, hygiene at, at the expense of, of a speed and efficiency. Um, it's a total rethink for us. Once we started off for these last nine weeks, I mean, that was everything. Number one was, you know, safety, hygiene for, for everybody. Um, you know, our uh, health department standards and uh, inspections gave us a great uh, footing there for that. Um, we have made and certainly will make available uh, PPE, hand washing protocols, et cetera. We do have sometimes customers, we have posted our signs on our uh, doors, clean your mask. We do provide them if people do not have them. Um, you know, it, it, it is very important that both sides uh, take care of one another. Um, our staff is uh, presently going, going through the National Restaurant Association Serve Safe protocols, programs, exams, etc. Uh, we have a certified food uh, production manager here and will do going forward every shift. Um, we we have done and will do temperature checks for our staff as well. Wish I had that camera, but uh, certainly we we will check those, log those, etc., um, and survey everybody before each shift. Um, the social distancing guidelines, you know, trying to again looking forward, how does that work for indoor and outdoor? Uh, we will certainly have some physical barriers in play that will kind of set people's minds uh, at, at uh, ease. Uh, it's a, we are in the middle of a total kind of overhaul here in our, in our dining room, our footprint outside, et cetera. We don't see a bar, I think, happening for quite a, quite a long time. Um, back in our kitchen, um, you know, verbal communication is very important. Uh, we don't necessarily want, want people waiting for their food to actually come up. So verbal communication about that, that order is actually ready. So, you know, trying to avoid those, those uh, scenarios of uh, uh, too many people in that one, uh, one uh, area. Uh, um, we are obviously sanitizing and cleaning all of our touch points. Um, numerous times daily, uh, whether it be back of the house, front of the house, outside, door handles, etc. cetera. Um, single use menus, we are uh, pretty much order by phone right now. Uh, payment as well, looking for that no, no, no touch right there as well. Uh, we look forward probably to a uh, reservation system only, initially starting off. Um, 
we feel that maybe we can gain some information about the guest as to what kind of an experience they want uh, before they actually come in. Um, we, you know, there will be no congregation by the front door. We look to create traffic flows that we have one door for entry, one door for exit, so we don't have that um, passing one another. Uh, your uh, table doesn't look 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 like it's going to be preset. You know, um, everything will be brought out at that time. So it, it's it is a lot of detail trying to uh, take care of uh, both em employees and our customers. Um, opportunities, you know, trying to um, strategize messaging. I feel is very um, very important today. Um, trying to message to the guests before they will actually come in, what your expectations are, um, respecting the actual space, kind of this is what it's going to feel like. Uh, signage, I feel, is going to be the actual new artwork so that we don't leave anything behind that people see what direction they are actually moving in, um, respectful of uh, others, other people's space. Um, I feel continuing to, to uh, tell your story, what your brand means, what you stand for, safety first. Um, you know, be, be real and uh, true to who you are and also to be a better, greater community partner together. You know, it, it is going to take a lot to, to move forward and um, we just got to understand that, that we need to work together more. So I must say some of my uh, fellow neighboring restaurants and others have been fantastic of sharing ideas and uh, best uh, practices, protocols, whatever. I mean, we can only do it, do it together. And again, just like Floyd and Spencer's um, items today, I certainly learned uh, quite a lot. Um, Advice to others on uh, reopening. Um, again, uh, I, I think it was uh, covered. The old business model cannot be your new model. Um, it doesn't matter what you know, but it matters what your staff knows because as an owner, you will not be able to touch everybody. Uh, so your staff is really you know, carrying out everything. So it's, that is one of our... Um, greatest things here. Um, sim simplify operations, I would say, you know, customers still want safe food. So, you know, treat it like that. Um, if you don't have a dining room starting off, be, be, be actually prepared to, to, to uh, be in the game for a takeout delivery. Uh, limit, limit your, your uh, menu. It's faster to uh, produce with less people in a confined area. It's easier to manage inventory and uh, purchasing. And um, err on the, on, on the safe side when you're, when you're reopening. Um, continually communicate, update your actual website and your app, social media. Um, you know, culture I feel is hugely important with this moving forward to be most protective. So have have a great culture for your, for your staff to actually work in and safety is paramount. Uh, collaborative business relationships I did, uh, I did touch on, you know, um, and then financial management is obviously tighter day, day to day con controls looking forward rather than backwards, you know, declining budgets, budgeting in, in uh, phases because, you know, the future, how will it be? How much, uh, how many people want to actually come back? But uh, I have certainly have, uh, have pages upon pages of um, operations and, uh, and uh, different things, but I think uh, Spencer and Floyd pretty much covered that. And um, I leave Great. it to you, you, Rob. Yeah, th thank you very much, David. And I, uh... You know, I, I think uh, just listening to these three discussions, I, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm really happy uh, with the sort of diversity of perspectives you've brought to the table because I think we've covered a lot of great uh, ground. I mean, I, I think I've heard some commonality from all of you, but also some very distinct differences based on 
the industries that you're in. I think one of the things that I, I think uh, I was asked on a, a, a news program earlier this week, and I did an interview about one of the most frequently overlooked components about reopening and, and the sort of new work environment. And my answer was around communication. And I think I've heard all of you speak to the role of communication and, and talking to your employees and talking to your customers. One of the questions we got in the chat was actually, you know, whether any of you have had to deal with communications in, in multiple languages for a, a diverse workforce. Obviously, we know Central New York is home to a, a really robust uh, refugee and new American population. So uh, to what extent have any of you had to sort of tailor your communications to folks who perhaps uh, speak different languages? Languages in. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, this is Floyd uh, at PPC. We have we have 17 languages actually in the Syracuse plant, so that's that's been a challenge front and center for us um, that we've tackled uh, in two ways. One, we have all of our documentation is in um, the the most prevalent languages, and then we always do a backup, which is we have translation um, face to face. Um, person to person when necessary. So that, that has been a challenge and especially in rapidly evolving times. Yeah, it, 17, that's, that's quite a few. We, we, have, uh, we have two in, uh, in our facility and so signage is, is definitely key, right, to have available in, in both languages. Um, and again, we're, the person to person communication is, is critical there too, just to ensure that uh, everything is getting translated, you know, in, in, in the way that uh, makes sense to, to folks who, who English isn't a, isn't a first language, so. A couple of questions have come in as it relates to um, what experiences you all have had, for, particularly, uh, probably mostly for you, uh, Spencer, but certainly probably to Floyd to some extent too, the extent to which you have employees who are working remotely. Uh, folks are asking whether or not you'd comment on two things. One, uh, how you've been able to maintain a culture, you know, the organizational culture when people aren't face-to-face, -face, and, uh, and the second has been around uh, whether or not you found any differences in efficiencies of people working from home. Sure, I'd be happy to address those. Um, interestingly, culture is, is something important to every successful organization, I think. And uh, in, in our uh, environment, uh, rapid response has been a business formal um, environment for many, many years. Our, uh, our staff in the operations center up until last year, as we've started to modernize our culture a bit more, uh, was shirt and tie uh, for the gentlemen and, and business formal for the ladies. Uh, we changed that last year. We relaxed a little bit more to business casual, but all the support departments are still business formal, uh, except for Fridays. Uh, with work from home, uh, one of the things that we've actually done in, in my group, in the sales and marketing group, is uh, reverse that. So every Friday we have our weekly sales meeting and uh, every Friday, everybody's dressed up formally for formal Friday, as opposed to business casual Friday. And so that's kind of a neat twist that we've done um, on our culture, but to sort of maintain that camaraderie, um, maintain that, that group feel. The other thing that we've been really lucky is we moved to, uh, to a cloud environment for a lot of our office um, functions. So, you know, Microsoft 365 has been a godsend for us because we can utilize Teams, uh, for sharing documents, for video calls. I mean, every call I get on with one of my colleagues, I dial them in teams and we're looking at each other. Um, we're having more huddle meetings where you have, you know, four or five people get together uh, like you might in an office or sort of to substitute for that walking by the desk um, and stopping by to talk to somebody. And then one of the other important things is uh, to understand the fact that you miss that human contact a lot of times with the virtual um, discussions and everything gets to be about just business and that small talk can disappear but that's an important part of our woke culture and it's important as a leader to remember it's okay even though it's virtual to ask somebody about what they've got going on in their weekend every call doesn't have to be uh, strictly business and so you can continue to drive that same culture that you have in the office through virtual communication digitally Great, uh, thank you for that. I think you know one of the other big questions, and, and this is something that we've heard consistently over the course of the last uh, many weeks. Just you know, maybe each of you probably have some experience with it. Um, how have you managed, especially in an environment where certain people are coming to work, uh, or you know, they're even in environments where they're working from home? And this is an issue for 
for my wife and I as well on childcare issues with the schools closed uh, now we know through the end of the year uh, what creative solutions have you found how have you found the, the impacts on your business uh, from people who are really struggling to uh, to deal with child care issues in this environment Lord, do you want to take that one I can take it too. sure yeah that's been a that's been a significant challenge uh, for for a large part of our workforce and and uh, I think people have found um, good ways to uh, to work around it as a company we've been as flexible as possible we've opened up our attendance policy we've also uh, extended um, flexibility for working hours and so that's been one of the keys for us as a company um, to help our employees deal with these difficult challenges is to give them the flexibility um, to move their hours as as suits their needs you know every individual case is different and uh, and we've 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 found that the flexibility that we've provided has been uh, one of the most helpful things that we could do as a company. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to echo that. We actually have 42 different start times in a 24 hour period. So there's a, there's a massive amount of flexibility for us, for those that are reporting to the office to be able to adjust shifts to maybe work with their, um, with their spouse or partner um, in a way that that way they still have childcare with the, with the fact that the schools have closed. Um, additionally, for those working from home, uh, that presents a whole different set of challenges, as you mentioned, Rob. Uh, oftentimes, you'll hear uh, dogs, the fur babies, or, or, or kids in the background. Um, and what we see is people shifting their work hours. So a lot of work is getting done um, in the evenings or early mornings from folks. People are, are working longer to get their work done because they are having to deal with some distractions in the home or having to help educate. Um, if they have to play the role of teacher as well. So that flexibility and understanding, I think, is really important, but all the while making sure that you're still um, maintaining the, the goals and, and the um, requirements that you have for the work product. And it's in the restaurant business, too. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, the nature of our business is family, so everybody kind of covers for uh, everybody else. You know, if I can't work today, Etc. But uh, everyone is flexible. Everyone is ready to uh, to uh, cover for everybody else. And obviously, with the uh, future future landscape, you know, hours may be actually reduced. So it'll be somewhat easier. I, I feel to uh, uh, we have already reached out to uh, to a lot of our staff to uh, find out. Well, moving forward here, what can you are can you not do? And also, what are your hidden talents? You know, so. Um, we feel that we have a good footing on that, hopefully. Yeah, I think that's really important. You know, we just sent a survey around our own staff at Center State asking, uh, asking them what some of the impediments might be to them as we consider return to work. And we know already child care is going to be up there at the top of the list. And, you know, we'll have to both, to your point, uh, Spencer, be flexible and, uh, and also look to, to find accommodations. I think this is, this is one of those times where, um, you know, the stress and anxiety associated with some of these challenges uh, there is a little bit of comfort in knowing that we're we're all facing them, uh, and uh, you know, and, and we all are finding ways to to be creative and and to make do, and you know, maybe more than anything is to just sort of be human and understand that uh, you know that the, the the situation today is not like it was nine weeks ago, and we all need to we all need to sort of reset our, our expectations, um, you know, as managers, as employers, uh, you know, as individuals and employees as well. Um, a couple of questions have come in asking whether we're recording this session and whether we'll make it available afterwards. The answer is yes. All of our uh, panelists have agreed to let us do that, and I thank you for that. So this recording will be uh, live and, and uh, will be online and available for, uh, for all of you to access afterwards so you can go back and think about some of these insights um, and, uh, uh, and hopefully use them as you're developing your own uh, reopening plan. We've got time probably for one more question. Uh, we got a couple that are that are here, but um, one of the most frequently asked questions that we've gotten, particularly over the last couple of weeks, as uh, as it's been clear that we were likely to be in a position to start reopening here, uh, you know, on the fifteenth uh, in Central New York, has been a question about uh, liability. Um, you know, sort of liability associated with uh, what happens if an employee comes to work and. I know there's been a number of you know, bills introduced in, in Albany and in Washington. Obviously, the, the goal is to um, 
um, you know, to try to make sure and create the safest environment possible. But just be curious from the three of your perspectives, uh, if you uh, have any, uh, any thoughts or insights that you might offer folks who are, who are worried about uh, the liability associated with, uh, you know, the current operating environment. Sure. Uh, this, this is Floyd. Um, I think for PPC, our goal has been to, uh, as we mentioned, adhere to the, uh, the authorities guidelines. And when my, my whole team has been really focused on, if someone asks the question, um, let's just say, for example, when somebody tests positive for COVID-19, the question is going to be asked, who were you in close personal contact with in your workplace? The answer to that question needs to be no one. Right, because of the measures you've taken inside the uh, inside your office, correct? Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think this is one of those issues uh, that I think we're we're all going to be wrestling with. Um, I know uh, I know it's front and center, uh, top of mind for folks right now, and I think it's going to continue to be as more businesses are allowed to reopen. Uh, I wish we had more uh, specific guidance we could provide, but you know maybe that's a topic that we could uh, plan for a future uh, for a future webinar and, and bring in some of our legal community to talk through some of the, the challenges and, and some of the, the strategies to, to manage that on a go forward basis. I, I would just say here, I know it's Friday, it's uh, almost four o'clock and we're gonna let you go, but um, I just wanna emphasize to all of you how much I appreciate the, the time that uh, those of you uh, who joined us as panelists today have spent with us, but also those of you who joined in uh, this Friday, previous Fridays, uh, you've given us uh, great insights into your own businesses. You've asked us great questions so that we can bring relevant programming to you in ways that can add value to you in this moment. Uh, I am uh, extremely proud of our team at Center State CEO for just how hard they've worked in this remote work environment, uh, maintaining our culture, sticking to our values, and and really uh, contributing uh, constructively to our community discussion and to our uh, economic recovery. Uh, for those of you who haven't found it already, please check out centerstateceo.com and look for our business reopening toolkit. We have a lot of resources uh, that are up there that are available and you can always reach out to us at support at centerstateceo.com with any question that you have. We're, we're here to help. Uh, we appreciate and actually, frankly, need and thrive on the engagement we're getting from all of our members and, and those of you who aren't members who uh, are getting to know us for the first time in this environment. Um, your, your questions, the challenges you're facing are, are motivating us to get up every day, come to work uh, in a remote work environment and, um, you know, and be in a position where we can make some positive change for our community. So thank you so much for your support, for your engagement and uh, look back soon on our website. We'll have uh, links up so that people can access this program again in the future. Hope you all have a, uh, have a wonderful weekend and thank you again to, to Spencer, to David and to Floyd. Have a great day. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.